Good morning. Welcome to the Tuolumne and Soulsbyville United Methodist Churches. Um, this week we're still just worshiping online. Our hope is to be able to um, add back um, the in-person service in Soulsbyville. Like we've we're finishing our, our pause and hopefully we're, we're going to start seeing cases go down um, and wouldn't that be good I mean, there's an awful lot to pray for um, pray for one another our community um, just everything that's going on with that let's join in a word of prayer dear lord we just uh thank you for holding us together, for being able to communicate with one another even times that we're not all gathered together. And Lord, we, we pray that your Spirit will make this a time of worship for us, open our hearts and our minds, lead us through this time together as we, we watch and sing along with, with this worship service. And Lord, oh, there is so much on our minds and our hearts, and we, we just pray that you uh, continue to lift up and encourage um, all, all the healthcare workers and first responders and all the utility workers, all those who who works so hard through through the winter and also through throughout this long pandemic. Uh, Lord, as they grow weary, give them strength. And Lord, we pray. We pray for families that are, are affected uh, by COVID-19 and uh, those who are unable to to have other health concerns taken care of because of just lack of capacity. We, Lord, we, we, we ask you to comfort and, and be with those who are lonely and those who mourn. And Lord, we, we, we just pray in, in times where, where the way is not so clear and, and it is hard to lead. Uh, we pray for the leaders of our community, uh, of our state and our nation. And Lord, we pray for ourselves. Lord, be with us, encourage us, give us strength, help us to hang on to our hope and, and, and not grow weary in being caring and compassionate. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, let's continue with worship.
Good morning, church. Our reading, our responsive reading this morning is Psalms 71, verses 1 through 6. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust, O oh Lord, from my, from my youth. Upon but you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My, my praise is continually of you. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. And he, said, he began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do hear in your hometown what we have heard you have done in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zephyrath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All of the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went his way. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. I invite you to join in a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, may all of our thoughts and our feelings and meditations of our minds and of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Well, you know, later on in chapter 15, Jesus spoke about a lost sheep, a lost coin, even a lost son. It doesn't use the word lost right here, but Homiletics Magazine got me thinking about lost apples. And maybe, maybe Jesus should have used this metaphor, lost apples you may not know it, but they're, they're hot right now because they contain important genetic material that can be bred into other apples. You know, apples were brought to the colonies by the early colonists. They were, were grown for a variety of important purposes. But over the years, many varieties are lost. Although there were once 17,000 named varieties grown here, today you're lucky to find 5,000. That's right. About 12,000 varieties of apples are, are in danger of being lost forever. In search of these nearly extinct apple varieties is the Lost Apple Project. According to Modern Fa Farmer magazine, the nonprofit organization has found 23 lost or nearly extinct apple varieties since 2014. In particular, they, they seek out and identify and preserve apple trees that were planted before 1920 in the Pacific Northwest. These antique apples have, well, they have some cool names. Excelsior, Streaked Pippin, Sorry Snippin, Nero. These varieties can't be found in, in the fruit section uh, of your local market, and they're in danger of disappearing. You know, when we moved to Anderson Valley, we're introduced to a whole wide variety of apples that you didn't see in the grocery store. And I became particularly fond of the Sierra Gold. And then we moved and we had a transparent apple tree in our front yard. It, it, it was a beautiful and tasty apple that would just almost dissolve in your mouth but it was almost impossible to ship because it was so fragile. Maybe, maybe that's why this whole concept of lost apples appeals to me. And, and I want to dig in deeper and, and find out what lessons we can learn. You might wonder, well, who, who runs the Lost Apple Project? And one of the founders is a former FBI and IRS investigator named Dave Binscooter. He said the history of these apple trees is just incredible. And since he began the painstaking work of apple hunting, he's gained a deeper understanding of how tough life was for, for people back when apples were first introduced to America. The truth of the matter is that these apples saved the lives of pioneers. He says the apple was by far the single most important thing they could grow. It, it had so many uses. And the importance of these apples might make you wonder, well, how come so many of them were close to extinction? Well, the fact is that, that some just don't taste very good. And many are, are so bitter or sour they could only be used to make hard cider. Others are hard to grow, so commercial growers, well, they're not interested in, in cultivating them. But still, they have value. Each apple has a unique genetic makeup, which can add to the diversity of the apple population. They can be used to, to breed other apples and help them grow better in various climates and changing conditions. 
Genetic diversity is a part of sustainability, says Ben Gutierrez, the curator of the USDA's National Apple Collection. Did you even know we had a national apple collection? He said each apple discovered carries a legacy, interesting genetics, and a unique story. Like people, every apple is unique. Well, do you think Jesus knew this? Every, every person is unique. Every person is valuable. And like apples, everyone is worth preserving for the good of all. The very beginning of Jesus' ministry, well, it was a smashing success. He, he, he traveled to Galilee and he began to teach in the synagogues. And, and Luke tells us that he was filled with the power of the Spirit and was praised by everyone. Yes, by everyone. He, he was the kind of teacher that you would want to present with a big red apple. Then he entered his hometown, Nazareth. And he went to the synagogue, and on the Sabbath he read from the book of the prophet Isaiah. In particular, that section said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, release the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. And after reading, Jesus sat down. And the townspeople looked at him, trying to figure him out. And then he said to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The people were impressed, and, and everyone said nice words about him and were amazed at his gracious speech. Oh, then they asked, Is, Isn't this Joseph's son? Jesus had incredible public speaking ability for, for the son of a carpenter. But, but Jesus wasn't content to soak up their admiration. He, he knew that he needed to speak the truth to them, even, even if it was a hard truth. And he said, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do also in your hometown the things that we heard that you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. And suddenly the words of Jesus went from sweet to sour. When Jesus quoted the proverb, doctor, cure yourself, and, and, and the word fine, yourself was, was probably referring to Nazareth. He, he expected that the people would want him, the doctor, to, to heal them, the people of his hometown. He, he went on to predict that they would ask him to do in his hometown the great things that they had heard that he did in Capernaum. And he concluded saying that they probably would reject him because no prophet is accepted in his hometown. The apple that Jesus held up to them was not a red delicious. Instead, it was more of a sour green one. Then Jesus embarked on his own lost apple project, turning away from the people of Israel and looking for some valuable varieties elsewhere. But the truth is, he said to them, Remember, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the, the heavens were shut for three and a half years. Uh, and there, there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet, Elijah was sent to none of them except the widow in Seraphath in Sidon. Well, the people in Nazareth knew the story. They didn't like it. In a time of drought and famine, the widows of Israel were suffering terribly. But, but God sent Elijah to a foreign town, Zarephath in Sidon, to help a widow there. Elijah raised her son from death, inspired her to say, Now I know that you are man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Jesus found the lost apple, called the widow, Azarephath, and discovered in her a path.
powerful statement of faith. And then Jesus said, there were many leopards in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. The people of Nazareth knew that story as well. And, you know, they didn't care for it at all. Naaman was a foreign army commander who followed the instructions of Elijah the prophet, and when he obeyed Elijah, he was healed of his leprosy. Jesus found the lost apple called Naaman the Syrian and saw in him true obedience to the prophet of God. And at this point, you know, the people of the synagogue couldn't stand it anymore. They, they, they were content with the 5,000 varieties of apples known. And, and these hidden varieties seemed worthless. We don't care about them. But, but Luke tells us that the, the people filled with rage towards Jesus, they got up and they, and they drove him out of town and they led him to the brow of the hill in which the town was built so they might hurl him off cliff. Well, yeah, it looked as though the public ministry of Jesus that was just started like gangbusters was going to end just as quickly. But, but, but God, God wasn't finished with him yet. Jesus just passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Jesus walked away from Nazareth and he continued his lost apple project by, by helping a man with an unclean spirit, healing the mother-in-law of Simon, cleansing a leopard, healing a paralytic, and calling a tax collector a tax collector named Levi, to follow him. Jesus believed that every person was unique. Every person was valuable. Every person was worth preserving for the good of all. Even nearly extinct varieties such as the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the Syrian. If you wonder about how central the, this, this project was for, for the ministry uh, of Jesus. I mean, we go all through Luke, and we see him looking for the lost and the outcast. And, but if you fast forward all the way towards the end to the 19th chapter, here he's passing through Jericho, and he sees up in a tree Zacchaeus. After inviting himself to stay in the house of the sour apple named Zacchaeus, Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. That's the lost apple project, according to Jesus, to seek out and save the lost. He knew there was valuable material in Zacchaeus that needed to be found and preserved his story has continued to, to, to build up the Christian community since the days there was first told by Luke. And, and so, who are the lost apples? The lost apples that need to be found and preserved for the good of all. Well, we can start looking at, our, at ourselves. If you feel if you feel like you're up in a tree, oh, doesn't doesn't seem kind of lonely right now? Stressed or distressed as we face this difficult situation, let Jesus find you. He wants to to touch you, forgive you, to heal you, to guide you. To be lost doesn't mean you are doomed. It simply means you're just not in the right place. You're not, you're not ever beyond his reach. And he truly, he truly wants you to be a part of, of the beloved community. And, and next, look around, look around yourself. Who is the widow of Zarephath? Who needs your attention? There are just, just so many people around us who are living in loneliness and isolation ready to give up 
as as the challenges of the day just seem almost too much. Be the hands of Jesus to them. Offer them your assistance. Be the heart of Jesus for them. Show them the unconditional love of God and don't hesitate to let to tell them, to tell them about the Christian faith and, and what motivates you, what gives you hope, what gives you life. And finally, widen your vision. Sometimes we just get too, too inward focused and too worried. Widen your vision and look at the power of God to be at work in, in, in surprising places. Expect to see Naaman the, the Syrian healed, even, even though he's living beyond the borders of your church, your community, or your nation. Find an opportunity to partner with another church or with a congregation of, of another faith to, to feed the hungry, to, to shelter the homeless. We should be willing to work with people of all faiths and, well, even people who don't have a, a stated faith or still searching for their faith, to, to make the community a better place. Remember, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He wants to preserve everyone for the good of all. Maybe that's simply the lesson that we can learn from the lost apples. Amen.